Mimi nataka ni wahakikishie ya kwamba sisi wote tuliopata nafasi ya kuchaguliwa kutoka MCAs wetu wabunge magavana maseneta mheshimiwa deputy president na mimi hapa pamoja na mawaziri wetu na wale wote ambao wamepata nafasi ya uongozi katika taifa letu la Kenya mimi nataka ni wahakikishie tutashikamana tutafanya kazi pamoja ili tutimize malengo yetu ya kubadilisha uchumi wa Kenya na kuhakikisha kwamba kila mkenya anapata nafasi ya kujiendeleza katika taifa letu la Kenya na wauliza viongozi wote sote tuliopata nafasi kutokana na kura za wananchi hawa tushikamane tushirikiane tufanye kazi pamoja ili tuweze kubadilisha embu wakati tunabadilisha Kenya asanteni tena watu wa embu kwa msaada wenu kwa kura zenu na kwa maombi yenu i want to say thank you very much to the great people of embu county as i thank all kenyans who step forward to vote in the last election so that we as the people of Kenya can maintain our democratic credentials as a nation that is democratic as a nation that is built on the firm foundation of multi-party democracy and now it is our opportunity all of us as leaders in government and in the opposition to work together to work making our nation great on this day 60 years ago kenya formally gained its right of internal government madaraka the mandate of majority african self-determination was a major step forward the emergence of this nation as a republic later that year that first madaraka day then was the golden dawn of our country's sovereignty freedom from colonial oppression autonomy from racist repression and liberty from foreign suppression in fighting for our sovereignty our noble freedom fighters had primarily waged a political struggle to liberate a people divided humiliated and impoverished under a predatory system whose institutions were vicious and extractive. So, although the freedom struggle was political and the first Madaraka Day represented political autonomy, every Kenyan African understood it to mean and to be the beginning of the hard and noble work of securing and enhancing social and economic freedom as well. For 60 decades, for six decades now, the people of Kenya have worked hard with admirable diligence and unwavering determination to perfect the political freedom of their nation through sustained socio-economic progress. In this manner, Kenyans have reiterated their commitment to true freedom by complementing political freedom with freedom from want, freedom from suffering, freedom from ignorance, and freedom from indignity. Our forefathers' historic struggle to vindicate our God-given rights of self-determination entailed tremendous sacrifice and immense determination against a colossal adversary. Ultimately, they triumphed. Similarly, our war against underdevelopment, poverty, unemployment, indignity, and vulnerability has been daunting. Yet, we have made steady progress year after year over six years of freedom. At the heart of our struggle for freedom, both before and after independence, is the distinctively Kenyan spirit of determination that is nevertheless flexible, consistency which is innovative, pragmatism that is also hopeful, 
and faith strong enough to take chances. The sacrifices required were inspired by a spirit that is truly unique, which transcends ordinary decision making. We recognize that spirit even now. It lives in the heart of every Kenyan who wakes up early to give their best, try their luck, knock on doors, and chase their dreams. We see it every day when we see traders, artisans, farmers, and other workers braving the scorching sun and enduring cold rain in pursuit of livelihood. We also witness in its the teach in teachers, nurses, police officers, extension officers, and technicians who go far from their comfort zone, often beyond the call of duty, to attend to Kenyans in their communities throughout all villages, all corners of our great republic. This noble ethic of willingness to struggle by working hard and embracing risk and of determination to achieve positive change in great leaps as well as in little installments has brought us far and will take us beyond the horizon of our destiny. Today, I join all Kenyans to celebrate our magnificent collective achievements and the spirit of brave endeavor which inspired them 60 years ago and sustain us today. This celebration speaks to the sustained effort we have invested in perfecting our national mandate of self-government. I will highlight the wonderful ways in which we have stewarded political freedom into democratic maturity, enhanced economic freedom by empowering enterprise and expanded social freedom by securing dignity. We must never forget that until fairly recently, our country's politics was divisive, violence, do or die affair by which neighbors, colleagues, and even relatives were incited into hatred in the name of political competition. In this dark era, the tribe was the fundamental term of all political engagement and the master variable of democratic contest. Many highly respected experts and eminent persons confidently affirmed that Kenyan politics is inherently tribal, and many leaders designed their political parties, policies, and campaigns on the basis of raw political appeals. Leaders also made sure that political discourse revolved around personalities and the private interests of a few privileged individuals and not the aspirations of the majority. Some used political parties as political vehicles to access the high table where important decisions were made and exploited their ethnic constituencies to negotiate a bigger share of public resources as well as positions of power and privilege in the service of private ends. For decades, Kenyans understood that this perverse political culture not only defiled our democracy, but also obstructed the spirit of daring and achievement, arresting our collective progress. The people of Kenya, therefore, yearned for freedom from the tyranny of political personality cults, toxic tribal discourse, and the violence they engendered. They desired a more unifying, cosmopolitan framework of engagement, which promoted the expression of their shared aspirations, encouraged inclusive negotiations, and a collective means of pursuing them. In the last general election, the people of Kenya finally broke free. The campaign was conducted purely on the basis of important national issues, foremost of which were economic issues. Not only did Kenyans reject the all divisive politics of tribe and tribal chiefs, but they also demanded and interrogated well-considered party manifestos with detailed plans for economic transformation. As a result, 
Although the election was closely, closely contested, it was the most peaceful in the multi-party era in Kenya. And I want to congratulate all Kenyans for being participants in this great feat. Our public discourse and political discussion and the agenda of social debate has changed for good. Substantive policy issues continue to define the national conversation well beyond the election. At the moment, there is a robust debate on the finance bill taking place everywhere in this country, in churches, social places, formal and informal workplaces, all media platforms and busy markets, as well as in urban and rural gatherings. We are truly a trailblazing nation. Many countries struggle in vain to generate a national debate on public financing, taxation, or other policy issues. In Kenya, we have easily sustained intense discourse on the finance bill and the affordable housing policy for weeks now. The debate has remained issue-oriented and there is no hint of divisive ethnic rhetoric at all. The cost of living is keeping all leaders, including myself, awake, and this is precisely as it should be. Superficially, the intense national debate on housing is not about whether it is a tax or a contribution. Their attention sharply focused on the housing contributions is an implicit expression of ownership. People desire better information and stronger assurance regarding the, the custody, security, investment, and return on their money. That is phenomenal. People are interested. How will their money be? Will it be safe? Will it be stolen? How is it going to benefit them? And how are they going to get a fair return for their contribution? I want to assure the people of Kenya that those questions will be answered. More encouragingly, the discourse on public finances and housing fund has opened our eyes to our emergence as a stakeholder republic. Kenyans today, more than ever, are fully involved citizens in shaping public policies and making institutions accountable in the manner in which they run national affairs. This is the vision of Madaraka expressed in the first article of our constitution, all sovereign power belongs to the people of Kenya. We have crossed a fundamental decision, a decisive threshold in the history of our political freedom and democratic maturity. Today, Kenyans of this generation honor patriots who went before us in this celebration of a noble and historic achievement. Kenya also set a new high in election management by deploying a secure, freely accessible public portal which accurately and faithfully relayed vote tallies in the last election, enabling Kenyans and indeed anyone else to compare and verify tallies and ascertain results. This enabled the IEBC to credibly declare and certify the winners of elections and to establish before court in response to petition by the certified candidates that the elections met the constitutional threshold as simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, and transparent. In fact, the openness and credibility of the 2022 election are affirmed by the fewer petitions filed, 124 petitions compared to 303 petitions in 2017. The economy was the most important issue on, the, on which the last election was canvassed. The people of Kenya in their multitudes made their voices heard, their ideas clear, 
and their desires known. From Busia to Banisa, Lokichogyo to Lamo, Magadi to Moyale, Mandera to Migori, and everywhere in between, the people said they wanted to transform our economic system, democratize opportunity, enhance inclusion, and reduce exploitation. Instead of the traditional campaigning of confrontation, incitement and division, the last campaign became a sustained national debate on the most pertinent economic issues, the millions of our unemployed youth, access to affordable credit, inclusive financing, promoting the robust expression of the legendary Kenyan hustling spirit through MSMEs and the facilitation of individual enterprise by enhancing market power through collective interventions like the Chama and SACO. This is how Kenyan entrepreneurs desired to secure access to credit, do savings, access the market, social security, and health insurance. By paying attention to their aspirations, we established that Kenyan entrepreneurs desire to pursue success through enterprise, which makes positive measures to ensure that no one is left behind or no one is exploited. It is an enterprise culture which encourages the pursuit of individual aspirations through collective systems which empower every person to succeed within the context of a thriving community. In the course of consultations with Kenyans at the grassroots throughout the country, we identified a number of barriers to effective realization of their economic well-being. The first was the bureaucracy in regulation and compliance, including tax administration. Second, the extreme informality of most enterprises which effectively relegated them to the margins of empowerment, facilitation or even recognition as lawful undertakings. Third, was the misconception around expanding the national tax base. Is it about people paying more or more people paying? The answer lies in empowering more Kenyans to enter the taxable income category through intentional effort to create millions of new jobs and millions of new taxpayers in due course. Fourth, a huge number of Kenyans, about 10 million, had either been blacklisted by the credit reference bureaus of inability to pay loans, advanced by financial technology platforms, or were struggling to pay. Other leaders, other lenders required hefty securities and valuable assets as collateral, yet these struggling entrepreneurs required financing to acquire such assets. It was clear, therefore, that the prevailing financing and credit facilities were not supportive to the profitable existence of micro, small, and medium enterprises. Self-employment accounts for 51% of all jobs in our economy. 83% or 15.3 million jobs are in the informal sector and only 3.6 million jobs are in the formal sector, representing a paltry 17%. Considering this employment landscape, it was imperative that we attend to the interests of these undeserved and underserved majority of workers urgently, resolutely, and effectively. This engagement with business community inspired the creation of the Financial Inclusion Fund, or the Hustler Fund, to eliminate the financial cost, delay and bureaucracy entailed in complying, the facility employs the latest fintech powered by Kenyan telecommunications corporations. The Hustler Fund also re-engineered the idea of collateral by deploying the borrower's credit score as effective security. Without a doubt, the Hustler Fund has been more than transformational. In fact, it is 
revolutionary on its way to becoming effectively the biggest financial institution by the number of borrowers and active loans. The Hustler Fund also turned around the country's fintech, transforming it from a predatory ecosystem to a more responsive one. As a result, Kenya's digital economy has received a tremendous shot in arm, as demonstrated by reports that Safaricom alone has enrolled at least 2 million new subscribers into their financial ecosystem, courtesy of the Hustler Fund. Today, as we celebrate progress in achieving economic freedom, we also celebrate our digital economy. Powered by our famous fintech community, Kenya's legendary spirit of enterprise has entered the digital space. Kenyans responded to this promise of economic freedom in an equivocal terms. The total number of digital transactions now at the Hustler Fund stands at 42.5 million, through which 20.2 million Kenyans have accessed nearly third Kenya shillings 30 billion and repaid close to 20 billion, with 7 million Kenyans being constant and repeat customers. Not a single shilling has been stolen through corruption, and borrowers do not need to know anyone, bribe any official, or go through any complex bureaucratic procedures to access the Hustler Fund. They only need a device, a little airtime, and a few minutes, and they are all able to get money wherever they are. The second product of the Hustler Fund will usher our unique collective-driven competitive market enterprise to the online domain. To promote inclusion, the Hustler Fund is going to deploy groups such as Chamas and Sacos, overcome exclusion and barriers to participate in credit savings, social security, health insurance, and other socioeconomic amenities. This is how we will use policy and technology innovation to mainstream our way of life. We are committed to leveraging fintech in ensuring that no one is left behind in the financial and entrepreneurial inclusivity revolution. I am delighted to announce that today, during this celebration, I shall be launching the second product of the Hustler Fund, which is aimed at facilitating people access funding through groups. I am sure that this will be very good news to my good friend Shiko in Ruaraka Market, who, like many informal business entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs were ready for this innovation even before we launch the first Hustler Fund uh, product. I am glad that this launch of the group loan product is taking place against the backdrop of the phenomenal success of the Hustler Fund personal loan product. I expect that this product will encounter even greater appetite from the market. As I have already mentioned, your credit score will determine the amount you can access and the amount you will continue to receive. Thus, we have equalized the formal and informal systems, enabling both to enhance their complementary contribution to jobs and wealth creation from an equal footing. As we celebrate this increase in our economic freedom, today we also celebrate the democratization of the Kenyan economy. This is why more Kenyans are taking part in the robust conversation about our economy. The conversation is inclusive, focusing on the proposals to raise revenues, to discourage imported goods that can be manufactured locally so as to grow local manufacturing and enhance export competitiveness. In this debate, Kenyans are interested in how government will create the one million jobs it has committed 
to provide through the affordable housing program. I know many people have questions about how and why are we having a conversation about housing in the Republic of Kenya. And progressively we are answering the how, we are answering the why, and we will answer every other question. Because right here in Nembu, and as we do in every part of Kenya, we have our own citizens, millions of young people who do not have a job. We have five million Kenyans across Kenya, young people out of school, out of college, out of uh, universities who do not have a job. It is our collective responsibility to think about the five million young people in Kenya who today walk our streets, walk our villages, in our townships, in our markets, and yet they do not have an opportunity to deploy their energy, their knowledge, their education in making a difference in their lives and making a difference in our nation. And I want to encourage all of us as the people of Kenya, as we look into this opportunity, I know many people are asking, how is it my business? How is it my responsibility? I have had many ask me, Mr. President, how is it my responsibility to think about those who do not have jobs? How is it my responsibility to think about the people who live in slums? Seven million Kenyans who live in slums, in indignity, without toilet, without running water, without roads. How is it my business? Let me ask the people of Kenya, if our freedom fighters, the people who made the ultimate sacrifice and lost their lives in liberating our nation, if they had asked the question that how is it their business today, we would be, we would continue to have been slaves of our masters if they asked themselves that question. It is our opportunity as they did to liberate our country. They went beyond the call of duty. They did not ask how is it their business to make the ultimate sacrifice to liberate our country. I want to ask every citizen, it is our responsibility collectively to think, to plan, and to ensure that the five million young people in our country who today do not have jobs, have jobs. It is our responsibility to ensure the people, seven million of them, who live in our slums, including Shauriako here in Embu. I was here last week and I was informed about Shauriako. The people who live in Shauriako deserve a decent house and it is our responsibility as we implement the housing plan not just to create jobs, at least a million jobs every year. It is also our responsibility to grow our manufacturing because housing will make sure that our, our entire manufacturing value chain from the cement in our factories to the steel in our factories to the doors and windows and hinges in our Juakali sector and our construction products industry, to the sand harvesters, to all the people who will be working in our construction sites, to the accountants and engineers and all the architects and all the technicians and the electricians, to every sector, the millions of young people that will be employed in this sector is sacrifice enough for us who are employed to make that contribution to the Hasla fund, to the housing fund, so that we can bring around the change that is going to take our country forward. Our vision for affordable housing program is premised firstly on the objective of creating 
a million direct and indirect employment opportunities throughout every value chain in the housing development ecosystem. A single house unit, a single housing unit is capable of employing three to five workers directly and an additional eight workers indirectly in the manufacturing of construction products, in transport, in logistics, and in all other sectors that contribute to the housing and construction industry. Secondly, the objective of affordable housing is to increase the number of homeowners and to transition more Kenyans from rent paying in informal settlements, in, in slums, and we have 1,411 1, slums in Kenya. We should transition those people, my countrymen and women, into homeowners. They should live in dignity like the rest of us because we owe them a duty of citizenship and a duty of comradeship as we live in one country. I want to ask every parent, I want to ask every Kenyan that rather than ask how is it your business, we must know that it is our business because the five million young people are our children, they are our citizens, we, they pay taxes and when we transition them into jobs, we are building a bigger pool of taxpayers. The conversation we have today in Kenya is different. I did promise the country three years ago that we are going to change the conversation. That the conversation is not going to be anymore about leaders. It is going to be about citizens. It is going to be about those who do not have jobs. It is going to be about our manufacturing. It is going to be about the millions who live in informal settlements. It is going to be about the people. I told the country that we are going to change the conversation. It is not going to be about changing the constitution and creating positions for leaders. It is going to be about changing the economy and creating opportunities for millions of young people, including the many who are today in our streets and villages the millions of young people who are looking up to us to provide them with opportunities to work. It's going to be about the ordinary people who work in the manufacturing sector, the people who also want to contribute, to be taxpayers, but because they have no jobs, they cannot pay tax. I promise the country that it is not going to be about sharing power. It is going to be not about sharing power, by the elite and by leaders. It is going to be about empowerment of every citizen, empowering our farmers to produce more so that we can get ourselves into food security, empowering our young people with jobs so that they too can contribute meaningfully to our economy and meaningfully to our taxpayers. It calls for us the empowerment of every citizen and every business person so that we can contribute to the economy of our country. I want to promise you, ladies and gentlemen, that that effort is on course and together we are going to move in that direction. To enhance our national productivity, we are prioritizing the consolidation, processing and value addition of our agricultural products. You just heard my dear sister, governor of Embu, say right here in Mashanga, we are going to build an aggregation and industrial park so that the people of Embu, and as we do it in Embu, we are doing it in every county in the Republic of Kenya. Last week, we advertised the first 14 agricultural aggregation and industrial park that will, build, will be built in every county so that we can consolidate our agricultural produce. We can provide for value addition. We can provide for agro-processing. We can enhance our manufacturing, create jobs, create value, and enhance 
the earnings of every farmer as we get rid of brokers, as we get rid of cartels, and ensure that we protect the hard earned and the sweat of farmers in the Republic of Kenya. Additionally, the government of Kenya will step up the establishment of five additional export processing zones in the coming year in Sagana, in Thika, in Joro, in Eldoret, and in Busia to complement the one in at the river, the one in Dongokundu, and the one in Naivasha. Because we believe that additional processing capacity, focusing on our exports that have come down in the last 10 years from 28% of our GDP to just around 10% of our GDP, that we need new impetus, we need new thinking, we need new infrastructure to be able to drive our exports. And that is why we are expanding our processing capacity in our export processing zones, in our special economic zones. And at the same time, we remain firmly committed to the continental free trade area and the effective implementation of the Africa continental free trade area. Just this week, we concluded working, a working retreat for trade ministers of the continental free trade area with the private sector. I am glad to welcome to this gathering the delegation that has been holding Africa private sector discussions in Nairobi, led by my brother, the President of Comoros, His Excellency Azali Asumani, and one of the most foremost champions of the Africa continental free trade area. It is also gratifying to note that the champion, the former president of Niger, is right in our midst. It's also gratifying to note that 11 trade ministers are here today from different countries in our continent. I wish to recognize the following delegations led by the ACFTA Secretariat. Delegation from Comoro, are they here, Wasimame? The delegation from Comoro, thank you very much. The delegation from Niger, thank you very much. Delegation from Central Africa Republic, the delegation from Chad, thank you very much, they are there. The delegation from Namibia, the delegation from Djibouti, the delegation from Cote d'Ivoire, the delegation from Nigeria, the delegation from Botswana, the delegation from Ghana, and the delegation from Burkina Faso. A significant portion of household budgets, as we all know, goes to food, a major component of the cost of living. Understandably, there has been animated engagement on this subject. After a prolonged drought, which pushed the entire Horn of Africa region to the brink of famine. Widespread shortages of stable foods have driven food prices beyond the ability of many households to afford them. Enhancing food production is an intervention with multiple fundamental implications. It promotes access to affordable and adequate food and nutrition for the majority. It also increases food supply, lowers prices, and thus reduce the cost of living. Moreover, subsidizing food production increases jobs and productivity in the country's biggest employer, the agricultural sector. In keeping with our commitment in this critical sector, we have registered five million farmers nationwide. These farmers immediately became eligible to receive subsidized fertilizer and those who step forward received their full fertilizer requirement, unlike in past seasons when the allocations were rationed. As a result of these allocations, as a result of these measures, Kenyan farmers have been able to plant an extra 200,000 acres this year by using an additional 2 million kilos of seed beyond what was planted last year. 
As international petroleum prices continue to rise beyond reach, the cost of fuel locally raises steeply. Transport, as a component of household budget, is affecting the cost of living. We have to liberate Kenyans from the reliance on transport that depends on petroleum. For this reason, we are rolling out an electric vehicle public transport system which will bring down the cost of transport significantly. Our border border industry is about to experience inclusive transformation through the introduction of more efficient, affordable, and clean motor, uh, vehicles. With this intervention, owning and operating a border border will become affordable, secure, and profitable. I am eager that this information reaches the seconder of my presidential nomination, Mr. Calvin Ocheng, who operates in Kilimani, so that he can escalate his hassle to the next level. I want, I have some good news for my border border friends. When I went around the country, they stepped forward and they told me they are victims of an exploitative financing system. I want to tell them, my good friends, I have some good news for you. We are going, we are developing, and by September this year, we will have a mechanism where you can get your border border that does not need petrol, that will be run on electricity, one that is financed by not a predatory system, but one that respects the interests of those who purchase the border borders. A healthy nation is liberated from human suffering and empowered to pursue their livelihoods and dreams without the hindrance and underperformance associated with ill health. A healthy nation is a happy nation. Freedom from disease is therefore a primary plank of our agenda to perfect self-government. We are committed to do affordably, inclusively, and in a manner that enables Kenyans to receive quality medical attention from the comfort of their homes. Towards this end, we are reforming the National Health Insurance Fund to meet the urgent needs of Kenyans at the bottom of the socio-economic structure by actualizing its purpose as a social medical insurance facility. Secondly, we have committed to deliver universal health coverage that enables every Kenyan attain dignified health care at the minimum cost of subscription fee. Thirdly, we have collaborated with county governments whom we support wholeheartedly. And I want to commend all county governments for the exemplary work they are doing around health as a devolved function. We have collaborating with the county governments to recruit community health workers, uh, promoters throughout the country. A hundred thousand of them will be recruited under this program and this number as will, will make it avail will make every one promoter available for 100 households. This means that each promoter which will, will be tasked with visiting Kenyans at their homes to determine whether, they are, whether any condition need to be managed through healthier lifestyle or basic medical attention. They will also be tasked with enabling patients with chronic conditions manage their medication, diet, and general well-being in a manner that makes hospitalization sometimes unnecessary. Finally, the promoters will facilitate early detection of conditions for referral to comprehensive attention in the spirit of effective healthcare management. Ladies and gentlemen, the imperative of Madaraka mandates us to build a strong, democratic, prosperous nation through the successful pursuit of high productivity and competitiveness. Industrialization and technology innovation is one such movement. All these things require people who are all empowered with knowledge, skills, and understanding, not only to effectively participate as informed citizens over democracy, but also to pursue meaningful livelihoods and perform their share 
of economic production and even go further and imagine, create and build the Kenya of our future. Education, therefore, matters for our freedom and self-reliance and is the enabler and optimizer of every other undertaking. We have taken all possible measures and pursued every available option to actualize our vision to make education at all levels accessible, affordable, and inclusive, and removed social and economic barriers to the attainment of the highest education by all Kenyans. Beyond subsidizing primary and secondary education in all our public and uh, uh, public primary and day secondary schools, we have reimagined higher education financing to deliver equity and broader access to all Kenyans with special attention to enabling the most vulnerable learners to realize their right to education. We have also employed 35,000 teachers in a historic and unprecedented drive to improve the national teacher-pupil ratio and enhance performance. Additionally, we are redesigning the competence-based education curriculum to make it responsive to our education needs at the point of our social, cultural, and economic development. Finally, the National Open University will obtain its charter in the course of this month and as we speak, courses are being uploaded for commissioning and later this year, Kenyans will have the opportunity to go to university from the comfort of their homes online. For long, tertiary education in Kenya has been a privilege for the most fortunate, while university education was the exclusive entitlement of the elite. Not anymore. Amanda Ko, I unveiled a new funding model for higher education that will make the universities and technical training fully inclusive, financially robust, and capable of competing with their peers globally while contributing to our national socioeconomic transformation through innovation, research, and development. The model is aimed at financially supporting increasing numbers of students enrolling in these institutions and ensuring that those from households at the bottom of the socio-economic structure enjoy equal education opportunities. The eternal conundrum of Kenya's integrity agenda revolves around the question of who will watch over the trustees of public interest and who will watch over the watchman. These questions do not arise because we have low trust. Rather, they exist because we have high expectations. Given that these expectations are legitimate in a technologically driven new millennium, we are increasingly resorting to technology as the answer to our transactional efficiency challenges. From the election results portal for our democracy to the Hustler Fund for MSMEs and the means testing instrument for higher education, as well as registration of farmers and distribution of fertilizer. Digital technology is enabling the government to deliver services efficiently and to give citizens confidence that the system is fair and incorruptible. We must therefore take a moment today to celebrate technology in general and in particular Kenyan fintech and other innovations that are making it possible for us to serve Kenyans to the best possible standard. I remind all Kenyans who work in technology and everyone who uses technology that our forefathers fought with basic technology against a technologically superior superpower and won our freedom. We have a duty to deploy the best innovations and technologies to make Kenya efficient, competitive, and prosperous. I am persuaded that technology holds the key to improving efficiency, enabling inclusion, promoting transparency and integrity, deepening trust and strengthening public confidence in government service provision. This is the reason why 
we are digitizing government information and taking public services online. On this day, I invite all Kenyans to embrace the new era of e-governance, which empowers people everywhere, including the majority at the bottom of the economic structure, to access government services at their convenience through their mobile devices. Since the advent of e-citizen, government gradually increased the number of services available on the platform from 391. The rate of increasing of increase of onboarded services is now shifting to a new radical trajectory. Today, 3,770 services have been onboarded and fully operational. Another 3,000 are on course to being completed. We expect 5,000 services to be online by the end of this month. Our ambition is to offer every government service on e-citizen platform by the end of this year. Finally, as we contemplate all the achievements we are celebrating today, let us reflect on the noble motivations and visions which inspired our heroic freedom fighters to make such immense sacrifices for the sake of freedom, not just for themselves, but also for the rest of their people who were not willing or able to join the struggle. Why did these heroes embrace such profound risk and danger in pursuit of a benefit that everyone else would enjoy? The answer must not only define our attitudes to public service, but it must also shape our understanding of the reasons and values that underlie collective undertakings and social policies. For our freedom fighters, a country in which anyone was unfree and oppressed was not worth living in. We have a duty to translate this truth into our political, social, and economic affairs. Our collectiv collectivist spirit that anchors competitive individual enterprise encapsulates this magnificent ethos. We owe each other certain duties as members of a community that we call a nation. Whenever we can do anything to make another person's life better, at no or little cost to ourselves, we have a solemn obligation to proceed and do it. There is fundamental, a fundamental level that at which we are morally obligated to think about our duties to the unemployed youth, vulnerable communities struggling in slums, and other people at risk of exclusion. Their struggle for dignity as human beings appeals to our duty of moral consideration. Their complicated pursuit of livelihood can potentially complicate our stable prospects. No human is an island. In community lies power, and to unlock that power, we must attend to our values and perform our obligations. That is why freedom fighters consider, that is why freedom fighters consider the inherent morality of their cause to be sufficient reward. For example, those, are, those of us who are earning Kenya shillings 200,000 monthly will pay only 2,500 to build a fund that will help, help create millions of jobs for millions of our young people and bring a meal on the tables of many hustlers. This is a worthwhile contribution to make for the greater good of our nation, as indeed the freedom fighters who came before us did. As we continue to make progress in our pursuit of the transformation of our economy from the bottom going up, we must remain vigilant that no one is left behind and no resources are lost to waste and corruption. Public servants, must ensure that public resources must be utilized solely and exclusively for purposes that serve the interests of all our people. I have made a personal commitment to use all instruments and authority 
at my disposal to curb waste and eliminate theft. I will not permit greed, lawlessness, or impunity. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our collective duty. Sisi wote kama wa Kenya. Mimi nimekuja hapa Embu katika sherehe hii ya muhimu ya madaraka ili tukubaliane kama wananchi vile wale walio tutangulia bila ya kujali watapata nini walipigania uhuru wetu damu yao ikamwagika wengine wakauawa lakini hawakurudi nyuma kwa sababu kama wangerudi nyuma leo tungetukua watumwa wa wale walikuwa wametutawala na ndio tunajiuliza kama taifa kama wa Kenya it is the moment for us to ask what can i do for my nation not what can my nation do for me both questions must be answered in the affirmative sote kama wananchi wa taifa la Kenya tumesema ya kwamba jambo la muhimu ambalo lilikuwa katika uchaguzi uliopita ilikuwa ni maneno ya uchumi wa taifa letu la Kenya ilikuwa ni maneno ya wananchi mamilioni vijana wetu ambao hawana ajira ilikuwa ni kati ya wale watu wengi hawana uwezo ya kupata mkopo kwa sababu hawana title deed hawana logbook leo ni jukumu letu kuhakikisha hata na wao wako na uwezo wako na e, njia ya kupata mkopo wajiendeleze maisha yao leo katika embu hapa wale walio katika vyama wale walio katika sako leo tunaanzisha hasla fund stage 2 ambayo itatoa pesa kati ya shilingi 1200 na shilingi milioni moja kwa vikundi ambazo zitajisajili ili tuweze kufikisha mambo ya kupata mkopo kwa wananchi wengi vile vile katika mpango wetu wa ujenzi wa manyumba nilikuwa hapa embu wiki iliyopita tumeanzisha ujenzi awamu ya kwanza nyumba mia moja kati mia ine ambazo tuna, ni awamu ya kwanza nimesema nitarudi hapa embu kama vile nitaenda sehemu zote za taifa letu la Kenya ili tuweze kujenga nyumba elfu miambili kila mwaka katika taifa letu la Kenya hizo nyumba elfu miambili sitatupatia ajira ya vijana milioni moja sitatuwezesha kampuni zetu za simiti kampuni zetu za chuma wale wanaotengeneza viti wale wanaotengeneza milango wale wanaotengeneza madirisha wale mafundi technicians masons carpenters electricians engineers architects quantity surveyors wale wanaofanya kazi katika transport sector madreva wetu makanga wetu wote watajumuika na tutakuwa na nafasi ya kupanga na kutengeneza ajira katika taifa letu la Kenya tuwaondoe vijana wetu ambao wako mitaani wako masokoni wako katika vijiji wamemaliza shule wamekamilisha college wamemaliza university lakini hawana ajira ni jukumu letu kama taifa kupanga ili vijana milioni tano wasiokuwa na ajira katika taifa letu la Kenya na wanaongezeka elfu mia nane kila mwaka tuwapangie ajira wasijisimamie na watusaidie kuendesha taifa letu na pia wao wachangie katika kulipa ushuru tuweze kujiondoa kama taifa kwa madeni na tujisimamie kama taifa letu la Kenya na wauliza wa Kenya wote jameni bila ya kuulizwa maswali ya kwamba mbona ni jukumu langu vipi tujue ya kwamba wale watoto ambao wanaangaika madukani barabarani 
vijijini hawa vijana ni watoto wetu hawa vijana na wakenya wenzetu tujiulize vile vile wale wa Kenya wanaishi katika vitongoji duni zaidi ya wakenya milioni saba jameni tuwaokoe pia hata na wao wanafaa kuwa na makao ya kutosha makao ma ambayo ni inawapatia heshima na ni jukumu letu sisi zote kama taifa moja taifa la Kenya mimi nawashukuru sana mimi nimefurahi kwamba leo katika Kenya mjadala sio ya kabila hii na kabila ile mjadala ni moja ni vipi tutahakikisha ya kwamba watoto wetu wanapata ajira mjadala ni vipi kampuni zetu za manufacturing zitaendelea mbele ni vipi tutakuwa na mpango wa kila mkenya kupata mkopo ni vipi tutasaidia wakulima wetu watuzalishie chakula tuondoe aibu ya njaa that is the conversation of our lifetime and that is a positive conversation in the republic of kenya mimi nawashukuru sana kwa kutukaribisha hapa embu nimefurahi sana watu wa embu nimesikia yale kiongozi wenu wa bunge wenu wameniambia kuhusu barabara zenu barabara ya kutoka kule mashanga mpaka piai nimesikia barabara ya kiritiri kanywambora nimesikia barabara ya hapa chini ena mpaka kavue nimesikia na haya mambo yote tumechi, tutajipanga na sote tukiwa na mpango huu tukipanga vizuri vile tutakuwa na pesa ya ushuru ya kupeleka taifa letu la Kenya mbele tutajiondoa kwa madeni na tutakamilisha miradi yetu yote nimewasikiza vile vile kuhusu mambo yenu ya maji najua na mnaelewa ya kwamba tuko na mpango ya mambo ya maji hapa embu tuko na dam ambayo tutajenga pale Kamumu tuko na dam ya Dhambana tuko na dam ya Doshi na tuko na dam zingine ndogo ndogo ambazo tutakubaliana na viongozi wenu wa bunge wenu pamoja na county government yenu iko katika mipango yetu haya mipango yote ni kwa manufaa yenu na ni jukumu letu sote tuungane kama watu wa embu kama watu wa Kenya ndio tuweze kutekeleza haya mambo mazuri yote ambayo yatatupeleka mbele kama taifa letu la Kenya najua vile vile mjumbe wa kutoka kule mbele aliniambia kuhusu barabara ya Kikunyari Kari Ishara pia hiyo barabara tutaishughulikia na zile zingine zote ambazo hazijatajwa hapa mimi nataka niwaambie ya kwamba tuko pamoja tutashirikiana pamoja watu wa embu tumekubaliana embu tumekubaliana mimi nataka nisikie sauti yenu tumekubaliana watu wa embu embu nisikie sauti yenu tena watu wa embu kama tumekubaliana asante sana it is now my honor and pleasure to introduce and officially launch the second product of Hustler Fund, the Hustler Group Loan. Asiri tutaangalia pale kwa mtandao kidogo. Asa, vikundi kote nchini vinaweza kujiwezesha kwa kuweka akiba na kupata mikopo ya bei nafuu kupitia simu wakijiunga na Hustler Fund. Kupitia mradi huu wa serikali, vikundi vya watu kumi na zaidi vinaweza kupata mikopo kwa urahisi kwa ajili ya kutimiza mahitaji yao na ya kibiashara. Kikundi kitapokea mkopo wa Hasla Fund moja kwa moja kwenye simu ya aina yoyote popote alipo bila kujaza fomu au kutozo dhamana. Maelezo ya credit score yatatumwa kwa wanachama wote. Vikundi vinaweza pata kiwango chochote cha pesa hadi milioni moja kwa riba ya asilimia saba kwa mwaka. Kila mwanachama atachangia kwa credit score. Kwa hivyo, mlipaji mwema ni wadhamana kubwa kwenye kikundi. Kila wanapolipa haraka, kiwango cha mkopo cha kikundi kinaongezwa. Kusajili kikundi chenu kwa Hustler Fund, mwenyekiti anafaa kubonyeza star 254 hash. Chagua Hustler Groups. Bonyeza 1 kuchagua kikundi chake na akubali masharti ili aweze kupata mikopo na kuwatumia wanachama wenzake. Hustler Fund 
jinue jiendeleze Asante sana Tunashukuru sana Thank you very much God bless you the great people of Embu God bless our great Republic of Kenya Asante sana watu wa Embu basi nitaomba tutulie kwa heshima naomba sote tutulie tafadhali kabla ya wimbo wa taifa niweze kuwajuza kwamba